Uh, next up is 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 uh, Dave Weibel from uh, Avian Rochester. Um, he actually creates targets for us, the DTNGT2. Uh, I know we've been in, in deep discussions with him about many topics. Uh, he's been educating us quite a bit. Um, so thank you, David, for that. And I know he's going to talk about targets today and the perils of dirty targets and outdated measurements, um, how to keep your targets clean, and when re and re when rehousing them and when to just throw them out. So uh, Dave, Dave R. Weibel is the president and founder of Avian Rochester LLC. Uh, since 2011, Avian Rochester has been de delivering college standard traditional custom measurements and consulting services to the industry. For the past six years, Avian has worked on a contract with the Library of Congress developing physical imaging targets and color imaging workflow technologies. David is now president of Gray Sky Imaging, a partnership with Roy Burns founded to address critical need for accurate color capture and the reproduction in the fields of archiving, museum, and gallery imaging. For over 20 years, he has taught color and imaging, uh, excuse me, has taught color and imaging undergraduate and at and graduate university classes in various professional short courses. He received a uh, master's in science in, um, and, and uh, excuse me, MS in color science from RIT, a PhD in color science from uh, Chiba University in Japan. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, hand the stage over to Dave. Um, so let's load up David's slide and here you go, Dave, take it away. Thank you, Pete, for that great introduction. Um, first, I just want to make it absolutely clear that it's the strangest thing in the world to give a talk about color targets to you all following up uh, Don Williams. It's kind of like, okay, uh, I guess I have something to add. <laughs> we do, well, we got something to add here, you'll see. But um, I recognize there's a bit of uh, a bit of irony here. So uh, Pete already read this for you, so we'll just uh, go ahead. Uh, right, so uh, there are so many targets out there and I've put just a few here, probably you recognize most of these. Um, you just heard Don talk extensively about the ISO target there on the right. Um, the NGT2 you see, the golden thread object level and all that. So um, so, uh, so my question, what we'll talk about here, oh, spacebar doesn't work, uh, okay. Um, so the question is, how do these targets differ? How would you, how would you differentiate between these? Uh, and the first one kind of obviously, we have that our object level target that is, that's meant, you know, it's really uh, small and narrow. It's meant to kind of sit in every single frame. And, uh, and and that's a, a different sort of format than all the rest of these, because um, all the rest of them are uh, are more intended uh, for uh, a, a session before where you would do this profile or you would do some other you know sort of camera analysis. They're dedicated targets for their use, um, not really for the day to day stuff like that golden thread uh, object level target. So that's kind of obvious. The physical configurations of the patches. Um, and then before we go on a little, I think you already heard enough about C-Lab, you know, Franz talked a little about this before and Don certainly made reference to this, but just so we are, we're aware, um, we have a, uh, on the left there, you see A star and B star, and equivalently, we have chroma and hue. Um, so you'll see people talking sometimes about LAB, uh, CIE LAB, and sometimes you'll see them talking about CIE LCH. Um, the spaces are equivalent. It's describing the same color, it's just a different notation. Um, uh, and so on the right, we can see where uh, uh, L star is going uh, black to white uh, up to 100, and then Q goes around the circle, and then chroma is the distance you are from the neutral, how chromatic, how, vi how visual, or vi how, uh, how intense that color is. So, so just so we know then what we're looking at here. So someone actually asked about this uh, in the previous um, presentation. So I know there's a lot here, so I'm just gonna walk through this. So the first thing I want you to notice is those little tiny black dots. Uh, first of all, right, so C-Lab. So this is uh, A star on the X-axis. So red on the right, green on the left, B star on the Y-axis, yellow on the top, blue on the bottom. So this is the same projection that Don showed you a few minutes ago. Um, so those little dots are this so-called pointer gamut which from a paper in 1980 in color research and application, a, a researcher in England, Mike Pointer, um, they basically measured and downloaded and Well, not in 1980, they didn't download much, but they, uh, they found all this kind of data and they, they, 
they uh, made this great article of basically the entire range of available physical colors. These are all, these aren't display colors. These are all physical things, uh, paints, pigments, um, objects, nat natural things, everything. Um, so that's kind of as far as you could possibly expect to go. And as you can see then, so, so kind of moving in, um, the next one we want to go to would be the open circles with an X in them. And those are the most chromatic Munsell color. So there's a Munsell space. Uh, a lot of that, whether you know it or not, you've probably all held Munsell colors in your hand if you've had targets from Don. A lot of Don's targets are, in fact, Munsell papers. Um, I don't think all of them are, but uh, you certainly many are. And so, um, so this is the maximum chroma that Munsell has been able to produce. Now, they don't go quite as far as the pointer gamut colors uh, in general, actually never, uh, because Munsell has made certain decisions about what kind of paints they're going to use. And they've got to be on paper and they've got to be glossy. They have to have these other physical properties that limit them. Um, but that's still a good target for as far out as we could go, as we could expect to go. Um, so next we have the two uh, colored circle, colored uh, patches. Those are uh, the color checker classic in the circle and the SG are X's. And so they go most of the way out to the Munsell limits, um, which makes sense because uh, the color checker SG is made by x right, which is also Munsell. Same kind of technology, same papers. Um, and on the red circle, sorry, I couldn't get these in the right color scheme uh, on uh, uh, without uh, about an hour's worth of work or more. So the red shows where the NGT colors lie. And as Don said, they're, they're more or less, uh, in terms of the the, the, the whole range, they're um, they're pretty close to the SG. There's a few little places where NGT2 is a little further out, and a few where the the um, the SG is a little bit further out. But I, I don't think we we see no no. I don't think anyone would make a case that uh, either of those are um, making any serious difference in the ability for one to profile versus the other one. So so there's one difference there. The uh, there's the second difference. This distribution of the patches in color space. Um, so next, how might those surface properties differ? Um, we could have patches that are very glossy. So now, just, just first, just look at all three of these. So the idea here is showing, okay, if I shine this light in, say at approximately 45 degrees, and that black line is, is kind of looking at the target, right, the side of a target, uh, of a patch. Um, and for a really glossy target, there's going to be a very narrow distribution of light reflecting off there to the right in that um, that that uh, specular angle, the mirror angle, um, and uh, so you'd have a very narrow distribution, um, uh, just like you would off of a mirror. Uh, in the middle, we show a slightly broader uh, range of angles coming off. That'd be like a semi-gloss uh, SG, which I think originally stood for semi-gloss, uh, as in color checker SG. Um, and then finally, uh, a straight matte one, and I've drawn kind of a perfect matte here, which there isn't really uh, too many perfect mats like that, but an almost uni uniform distribution. So, so, uh, so there's that light incident uh, uh, at the the, uh, the 45 degree side, and then and then the light is distributed, reflection is distributed almost uniformly for a very nice diffuse uh, diffuse patch. Um, and then these, uh, just to, to uh, in general terms, right, the NGT2 tends to be they behave like this glossy one. Uh, the color checker SG is kind of in between. And then the color checker 24, that original uh, color checker 24 is, um, is very matte, um, which, is, which is good and bad. We'll see uh, in a little bit. So how else might these targets differ? Um, you might, uh, some of them have a serial number right on them or, or like Don's QR codes, right? So that you can um, reference from an image precisely the right target that it was, not just the type of target. I want to know the actual target. Um, some of them, like you've seen on the, uh, the golden thread object level target, put the color values right on there. Now, the thing with those is those are, uh, as also Don alluded to, those are batch measurements for kind of averages for all golden thread colors. Don can't print individuals, um, individual colors on those. But as you heard him say, that QR code does get you to the individual values for that specific target. But, but the, uh, so, so it's available. Um, the distribution of white. So this has to do with um, being able to do a, um, 
an estimation of the distribution of uh, the light source if you want, um, give you a chance to uh, at least estimate that. Um, row column labels you saw in many of these fiduciary marks, this let you um, let the software or the human uh, look at the patches a little better. Um, and then the spatial, uh, the spatial information that you saw, especially on that ISO target, Don showed you, and, and on others too, um, have the ability to quantify more than just color. Um, okay. So, uh, how might we treat a, a target? I say, be nice to your target. Uh, and so, the goal, of course, is to keep your targets in pristine condition, and then uh, from that, you will get consistent profiling results. So we'd store the store it in its sleeve or its box. We'd limit time and say dusty or dirty environments where uh, it might um, kind of be damaged. Um, we certainly want to avoid that whenever we can. Um, uh, but I would say uh, in the real world, uh, stuff's gonna happen, right? So pristine is, you know, it's not gonna be pristine. Um, in the real world, things are gonna happen. So, so our goal isn't to keep it perfect. The goal is to keep it as best that we can. And then we'll get the most consistent profiling that we can given that, uh, that situation. So kind of related to that, um, we would clean it when we, uh, when we can. Yeah, I guess that's this one. Uh, so we can clean the target when it's soiled. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about that in a little bit. Um, and then when, when necessary, we measure. We try to avoid this uh, at all costs, really, because a number of reasons it's expensive, costs time, people, uh, people technicians uh, cost money, and uh, instrumentation uh, costs money. And, uh, and then also you're gonna have to take the data that you get and get that into your software for your profiling again. So there's, uh, there's a process that would be involved in that, which most of you understand uh, already, maybe better than me. Um, but the point is, you really don't want to remeasure if you can get away with it. So life events in the uh, in the life of a target. Uh, first would be new from the manufacturer, fresh and accurate calibration data. So this just came from uh, Digital Transitions. It's got the fresh uh, measurements from AV and Rochester in there. Uh, and uh, useful for profiling, of course it is. Uh, when we have regular use with appropriate care, which we can talk about, uh, useful for profiling, yes, of course. Uh, expected typical soiling and proper cleaning. Uh, yes, we're still able to do profiling. Uh, more drastic soiling or damage, proper cleaning, and then possibly now we've done remeasurement because we kind of had to. Uh, and now are we ready for profiling? Yes, of course. Um, unrecoverable soiling or damage. Uh, and unfortunately, as Peter said something about this earlier, uh, there is gonna be a time when no matter how much you love that wonderful target, you are just gonna have to part ways and get yourself a new one. Um, um, we hope, of course, for something like uh, something robust like the, uh, like the NGT, we hope that that is a long, long time. Uh, but also the reality is you should recognize that this is a possibility depending on just what you do uh, to that target. Um, I've always said, yes, you can, uh, you can get some dust and fingerprints on these targets, um, uh, but you can't take a screwdriver to it, you know, and then that may be a, a situation when you're going to uh, have to replace it. Uh, so when should you clean it? Uh, this is the, uh, the line there for expected typical soiling, right? So is the target soiled? So you can, uh, you can just look at it, obviously. Um, and uh, most of these targets are gonna show pretty obviously visually if you got an issue. Um, I, I'd say concerns from image data, if you see something uh, that you can't explain otherwise, uh, you could think about that and concerns from profiling results. So I would say um, th th this is again, well, we'll get to this in a second here, hold on. Um, so if uh, things are more drastic, uh, uh, then you may have to do some cleaning and remeasurement, and then you can remeasure those in house if you have that capability. Uh, you can remeasure by a third party. Um, we're happy to help that with you. Just see the DT guys. Um, so now I went to discard. So this is a little bit. So you saw an image kind of like this from Don a minute ago. So so hopefully this is the last resort, uh, and. Um, and, and Don's software apparently does this. I wasn't aware of this, but my second bullet there, consider the location of the damage. So if you can, uh, if your damage is say in the, 
in the diagram I've just shown, the black squares are what the software is going to average, where it's going to get the RGBs from the image for the profiling results, uh, for the profiling. Um, you can see then if there was damage to a patch outside that area, or if you're using Don software and, and it has the ability to actually move that square a little bit and get to an area of the patch that's uniform and clean, then uh, maybe you don't necessarily have to be um, discarding things or possibly not even remeasuring things if you are confident that uh, that, that uh, is, um, is the case, that you're getting good data for that particular patch. Um, other mechanical issues like warping, um, I don't think this is a, as, as huge an issue as it used to be when uh, color checkers used to be on paper. And I think we've all, anyone that's been around a few years has seen these massively warped targets and you have to spend uh, a little bit of time making sure they're really flat. Otherwise, you can have all kinds of issues uh, with that. Um, and then the last bullet, the sad, sad day uh, is that you may just have to go ahead and uh, and toss that target and get yourself a new one. Um, and of course, we can help you with that too. Um, because a bad target may be worse than no target. If it's actually steering you in the wrong direction and giving you some results that are wrong, uh, that's never a good thing. So um, actually, before we do that, just one thing I want to comment on um, in terms of, uh, you know, this is, you may then go look at your target, your uh, profiling results, and you probably all would do this naturally, I suppose. But when you see uh, maybe a little spike in your delta E's or 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 some other color differences you're looking at, um, you may easily just go back and have a look at those individual patches and say, "Oh, gee, look, there is a mark on there. I have to, I have to, uh, I have to clean that up, or I have to figure out a way to get it." Uh, maybe. I don't know, Don can tell you if his software lets you just pick a patch and say, yeah, don't even use this uh, because I know it's got a problem. Um, uh, then that would be a way to avoid having to um, discard the target if you have some ability to do that. To, uh, to... And then I suppose in the, in the terms of the, uh, at least speaking specifically about the NGT2, um, we can always replace patches for you if you do, um, if you do damage them uh, badly uh, and you want, you know, you could talk to the guys, uh, talk to DT, and we'll figure something out for you because we can always do that. Okay, so uh, off to my little demo of some fun uh, cleaning. So I'm going to uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to change cameras. So you're going to lose me for just a second. Uh, roughly about ten minutes left. Perfect. I'm sorry, I'm looking down from the top. So, uh, but before we get into that, I just wanted to say, you know, all time, uh, any time is a good time for a snack. So I just, I have some uh, some nice, oh, you can't see me now. I have to show you this way. I only have one camera. So what do I have, Cheetos here? Because, because your technicians always eat Cheetos uh, in the lab, right? Before they measure stuff, right? I got potato chips and I got the greasy, kettle cooked kind they are the most delicious um and then of course reese's peanut butter cups one of my, my favorites so i actually had this sitting on my keyboard for a little while to make sure that it's all nice and melted so ooh, look at this now ooh, now imagine what's going to happen here i'm going to wipe my fingers a little bit but now i would just want to point out a couple nice things about this target so uh there's that really nice red right there. And there's that really nice green right there and that really nice blue right there. I just took some measurements of those. And I don't know if you can tell how much chocolate and, and Cheetos I just transferred onto those, but um, uh, it's pretty significant. I don't know if you guys can see, uh, maybe not, but it's, it's, uh, it's bad. You would shoot your technician for doing that or your photographer. Uh, but I just went and did it. So, uh, and, and then a few other things, because, you know, you never know when you get thirsty. And so, of course, you want to keep open Cokes near your targets because you just you just never know. You might, oh, oh my goodness, look what happened there. How could I have been so silly? And I'll shake it off onto my color checker. Um, and this is just a catastrophe, isn't it? Uh, 
First, I'm going to just give them a rinse, get some of that coke off. Maybe I should rinse this one off too. Got some of that coke. I don't want to get too sticky here. Uh, so, whoa, there we go. Now, so what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, going to have to clean this up somehow. So I did take some measurements before. I didn't want to get too much chocolate on my instrument because I spend a lot of money on instruments. So I have to sort of pre-clean them first. So I'm just going to do this quick and I'm going to look over at my data. Unfortunately, I can't show you the data. I'm sorry. But I will say that this, uh, let's see, 341. Uh, so I'm off by uh, probably a good delta of two or three right now. Um, and sorry, again, sorry, you can't, sh I can't show you that. But what I'm going to do is first, I got some little peck pads here. Um, and I'm going to clean this up a little bit, get a little water. Water is good. Maybe, maybe something a little stronger than water. I imagine for peanut butter, we're going to need something a little stronger than water. And you all at home will never clean your NGTs like this, but I am a professional. Uh, I'm also going to put some uh, IPA, some uh, uh, isopropyl alcohol, and again, you are not allowed to do this. But I, but you're also not allowed to spread chocolate on your targets either. So um, I'm going to do this and try to get all of that peanut butter off. I just measured these three RGBs in the middle. That's why I kind of focused in on them with my. Uh, I said peanut butter. It's really chocolate, isn't it? Or it's both. <sighs> Okay, so there's that. I'm gonna just take another measurement. Just, just focusing on the red one here because I don't have time to measure all of these. And so let's see, what did we just do? Uh, I did bring the I did bring the color a little bit back toward uh, the original reference colors. Actually, wow, they're really close. Uh, Nothing off by more than about a half unit there, which, in case you're wondering, is about the limit of accuracy of these handheld instruments you're using anyway. Uh, maybe that's a dirty little secret in the color science world. Um, so let's uh, take a look then at the color Tucker SG now. Uh, we could put a little time in there, Pete, of how long I have here I'll, in the chat, please. Um, so I'm going to just dry this off. Uh, a good five minutes left. Five minutes, that's going to be plenty here. So because because I have not had enough Reese's peanut butter cup yet. And now, again, I point out these reds, greens, and blues. These are, these are my favorite patches. Mm, this is terrible. So, again... Gotta try first. I'm gonna try to get the the uh, chocolate off with Coca Cola. Turns out it's not gonna work very well. I'm gonna do a little rinse. And again, I wish I could measure these, but I'm not gonna do that to my instrument without a little bit of cleanup. So the water is not gonna quite cut it here. So I'm gonna get a little alcohol out and. See what happens here. Alcohol, I'm just gonna again focus on red. And well, you can't, you might not be able to quite see it. Well, it's probably some peanut butter and it's some actual paints coming up, sorry to say. Um, trying not to be too dangerous here, but uh, cleaning them up good. Okay, well, I don't know if you can see, there's some Definitely a little pigment on there. So I've removed a little bit of color from there in order to get it clean. And we're going to take a measurement. Give it a measurement. Uh, let's see how we're doing now. Let's see if we made it back. So again, sorry, I can't show you these data. Uh, 39, 60, 32. Yeah, we had a bit of a change, as you might expect, after removing, you know, a little color came off. So it's a little bit lighter. Uh, you can't see, but I can see that it, it, the surface definitely took a little bit of a hit in order to get all of that chocolate off. Um, 
So that's kind of most of what I wanted to say besides just eat lots of snacks on somebody else's time here. Um, and I think unless, uh, unless there's, well, hopefully there's some questions, but I think uh, I'm about done. And I, I hope, hopefully what I showed is that, um, you know, it, it is actually, I'll be honest, it's harder than I thought to damage either of these targets, uh, to be honest. Uh, you, you have to, uh, but I mean, if you, if you need to get out a solvent uh, for some oil or some other sorts of contamination, um, I can, the NGT is going to put up with that a little bit better than the Color Checker SG is. Uh, we'll say that for sure. All right, I'm going to get my camera back here. Just one second. You're going to lose me for a bit. Um, so that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have uh, just a little, uh, my contact information there. If you got any questions, we run out of time uh, today or this afternoon. Uh, you can always let me know there. Uh, if you do contact me, first of all, I won't answer. Oh, my phone number's wrong there. Sorry, <laughs> typo. Um, uh, assuming you get my right number, uh, which is 5956, uh, I probably won't answer because I won't recognize your number. But you leave a message and I will get back to you. Um, so with that, uh, I'll take some questions if you have them. Uh, awesome, thank you very David. much for your time. Awesome, Thanks David. For your time. This, you. was, this was fun. I hope you'll uh, be, uh, you know, forgive me this little indulgement of some insanity, uh, but I had fun doing it. I, I, I have to say I, I did as well, so thank you. So we're ready for some questions uh, as they pop up. Uh, first one is from Antonio. When profiling under glass, should, could pigments touch should the glass? Should they touch the glass? Wow. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to have to defer that question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't think it would be a problem. Uh, I would, in my, in my book, what I would want to do is I would want to treat the target the same way you're going to treat the things that you're going to put under the glass for your measurement, right? If, you're, if your stuff is right flush against the glass, then I would say you'd want your target to be right flush against the glass too. Um, but there are people that know more about this than me. Uh, I, I don't. I don't work through glass too often, honestly. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, this is from Gregory. How drastic soiling or damage would require remedy? Yeah, good question. I, I think it, you're going to have to. I mean, use a little bit of uh, just common sense, and also, uh, you know, if you can. If you're gonna, if you see differences in your uh, your results, then I think you know that you might have a problem there, right? Like for example, um, assuming you don't damage, you know, your target uniformly, like leave it all out in the sun or something, um, you're gonna see individual patches that have a problem, right? Like um, I think yesterday in one of the conversations, they were talking about things degrading over time or something, and Kurt made a comment about it might well just be your light source. And that's true. And in this case, how, why I would bring that into this conversation would be that if, if it was your light source changing, everything would sort of change uniformly in one way. And if it was your camera or your other sorts of things, everything would change kind of uniformly in one way. But when you're looking at the target, I think you're going to see individual patches or maybe a little cluster of patches that have got a real problem. Um, and that might be where you'd want to start in terms of your, uh, your cleaning. Um, and, and if they need remeasurement, I mean, I don't know the answer to that. Really, you'd have to just look and see whether you're seeing some changes in the uh, the camera results. That would be the best, best thing I could recommend. Um, Sounds good. I'm waiting up for the okay. next question here. Yeah, I see a couple things there. But... All right, I'll, I'll throw one out. Uh, something came up about, can you touch on the difference between glossy and matte patches for profiling? Is there a preference? Yeah. Um, difference? I, I think that uh, it, the short answer is probably no uh, for profiling, if that's the question. Uh, but there's more to it than these targets. I mean, the, 
the original color checker that is the full mat that you know you've probably all seen. And by the way, you notice I didn't do that over here because that would have just absolutely destroyed the target the first thing. You know, you really can't even, you can barely touch that mat surface and not damage it uh, and change its color and change its camera results, its camera RGB. Um, so, so can you profile with mat? Yes, you can. But from a target point of view, it really is less than ideal. Uh, you really want something more like these two targets I just showed you because you do have this ability to, to, um, to clean them uh, a little bit. Um, so like I've shown you, well, a lot in some cases if you have a, a peanut butter case around. So. Well, if you look at it a slightly different way, say they're both in pristine condition and both in recently have uh, new target data files or measurement files for them. There is there one preference over the other? I, I don't think so. I think from a profound point of view, you're going to be able to do the same thing with either. That's my, my that, that'd be what I would say. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, next question up. How often should the, I guess, the color reader or measurement device yeah, be calibrated? Yeah, that's something that is left. Uh, and if I keep throwing these back at you. I'll throw this back at Greg. I'll throw it back at you, Xander. No, I mean, the uh, if you go to like ISO 9001 kind of stuff or ISO 17025, which is the one that uh, covers laboratory procedures. Um, it's the end user that decides how often things are calibrated. If you go to x right and say, how often should I get it calibrated? They'll say uh, once a year, because apparently when the Earth reaches that spot in orbit again, your instrument results go kaput. Uh, and I don't know why that is. Well, I do know why that is. It's money. They want you to send that in, <clears throat> excuse me, because it's an important revenue stream for them. Uh, and now, Hmm. To be fair, should you send your instrument in now and then have the factory look at it? Yes. Uh, should it be done on an annual basis? I, I don't know. That would be up to you. If you've got instruments that are seeing a lot of rough handling, less trained observers, um, seeing a lot of maybe field use, uh, probably annual is not so bad. Uh, if you got pristine instruments that sit in a very clean lab, they get used once a month by trained technicians, you probably don't need to have them done now. Ultimately, here's what here's my answer for you, Xander, is what you should do is you can get some stable reference materials, ceramic tiles, for example, and you measure those about once a month, maybe once every other week. And you pull them out of the drawer and you measure those, and those are going to be very stable over time, and you compare your instruments results to those from month to month to month. And when that starts to diverge in a way that you think, think is unacceptable, delta E or two maybe units, then that's time to send it back. Uh, and I can certainly help you with those tiles or, or with some advice uh, for how to go about that testing. Uh, but that's really, that, that's my best answer would be to actually keep an eye on the instrument yourself with some stable reference material. And by the way, neither of these back here, yes, they are stable, but they are, but I would not, uh, I would not use uh, those targets because you're relying on those targets for other things, right? I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, uh, use those as the reference. I would go to some ceramic tiles that are a little more robust and very stable over time. Uh, Dave, I have a question while I wait for another one to pop up. <clears throat> the the color swatches on the DT NGT2 or, or the SG target, are they susceptible to any particular chemical or solvent um, that you know of? I've done a lot of experiment with isopropyl alcohol. Um, I could put some acetone on them. I have never done that before. Uh, you could certainly use mild soap, mild, you know, get a little dishwashing detergent, something mild, um, Dawn or Joy or something is good. And you could use that. That would probably do a little better at lifting oils than, uh, isopropyl alcohol would. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, but those two would certainly be okay. I can't say I've experimented with anything more, drastic than IPA and uh, the isopropyl alcohol, and that's definitely safe in any quantities and any, you know, whatever you want to do uh, with that. So I would say sort of warm soapy water for grease. Um, other things can get lifted nicely with the isopropyl alcohol. And I'm not sure I would go any further than that. Um, any susceptibility to like other environmental variable variables like pollution? Um, I would say, in general, you would just want to avoid that stuff. I don't have data for that, though, no. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, here's a question from Matt. Could you use the calibration tile included with your instrument for checking its performance? That's a good question, but the answer is unfortunately no. 
and I can explain why, but it'll take a little while. Uh, th think about it this way. Um, your, what, what the, if you go to the camera world, right? Uh, let's see. So let's say I take an image of my, of a white patch, right? And uh, like Don, I close my eyes to think. Um, take an image of a white patch, you run it through your profile and your profile, cause it's, it's a perfect profile by the way. And, uh, so uh, you run it through your profile and out comes the C-Lab data that are the reference data, right? Because I said your profile is perfect. Um, now I dirty up that white tile, but I reprofile to it, which is what you do when you calibrate your instrument. Essentially, you are reprofiling your camera back to that standard tile again. So I'll say, dirty up my mm -hmm. white tile. I reprofile now. And now I take an image and I run it through my, of that white spot and I run it through my, my profile again. The color at the other end is the reference data again. It doesn't know that the tiles, that the patch is dirty. In fact, it thinks it's clean. It assumes you know what you're doing. And so uh, just like that, my, if I dirty my white tile on my instrument and recalibrate to it and measure it, it will still predict those same values even, even if it was clean. It's kind of weird to think about, but that is the way the instrument works. That's the way the calibration process works for that instrument. I think that's a, a very good point and, and it makes a ton of sense. Um, this is gonna be our last question for this, uh, this <laughs> session uh, or, this, or this part yeah. of the session. Uh, this is from Kurt. Do you have an opinion, thought, comments on measurement geometry options for target measurements? Uh, There's yeah. a busy. This could be a, this could be a yeah, whole let's, presentation. Let's, um, <laughs> let's discuss this over in the, over in the Google Meets. Um, this is a big deal. Don and I have had extensive conversations about this in the last, uh, just the last couple of months. Um, and, and maybe Kurt, you've even been on some of that, I'm not sure. Uh, but let's, let's take that over there. Uh, the answer is, the answer is yes. There's nothing really, there's no reason why we're in bed with 450 geometry that is your I1s. Uh, yeah, this one I've been using today, this Konica Nolta FD7 is also 450. I have other geometries over here. You know, I got a whole slew of, I got all the instruments here, so I can do whatever I want, but um, I know most of you can't. Uh, I can say for a lot of Roy Burns research over the years, he used uh, uh, integrated sphere diffuse molecular excluded measurement. Apologies if you don't know what that is, we can talk about it over there in Google Meets. Um, I have a feeling also we, we might extend that into the, to the happy hour as well, because it's just one of those complicated yeah. Things that you can kind of chew on. Yeah, for and a plus, long I would time. like Don involved in this conversation too, because I know he's he's got some uh, he has thoughts uh, about this as well. So, and yep. he won't be at the breakout because he's in his own breakout. So, um, but we can certainly have uh, a little conversation about that. That'd be great, and and honestly, it'd be kind of I, I I'd even like to see that on the on the Image Muse forum as well. I think it's a very good topic Agreed. and very timely. Agreed. Cameras and spectrophotometers, they are. Significantly different animals. Okay, well, this has been great, Dave. Thank you so much.